Hi, and welcome to part two of my dataset miniseries, where I'm taking a closer look at the physics and the signal path involved in storing digital data on magnetic tape using this Commodore dataset here. Originating in the 1960s, these audio cassettes contain a plastic tape coated with a thin magnetic layer. Different materials have been developed over the years, but the data set works best with the original Type 1 ferric oxide tapes with that classic rust color. At the right head, over here, the tape is exposed to the field of a little electromagnet. This electromagnet magnetizes the ferric oxide particles either to one or the opposite direction depending on the sign of the current flowing through the coil of our right head. And that way we can write a stream of digital information onto the moving tape. Let's take a look at how that is done in the signal path of the data set. We can identify four inverters here and this is really all there is to the right path. If we start with zero volts at the beginning we end up with zero volts at the top line, since we cross two inverters. On the bottom line, since we cross three inverters, we would end up with five volts. If we start with five volts instead, we end up with five volts at the top line and zero volts at the bottom line. So this little circuit effectively controls the polarity of the voltage applied to the right head up here and also the resulting current. So that looks pretty straightforward. But what about reading back our data now? That's where things get a little more interesting. During a read operation, the magnetic field of our tape produces a magnetic flux through the reed head coil. According to Faraday's law of induction, the voltage induced in the coil is equal to the negative rate of change of, of that flux. So we get a signal proportional to the negative rate of change in B caused by our tape moving past the reed head. Let's take a look at an example. Let us assume that our tape, when moving past the reed head, shows a magnetic field B like so. So this is maybe a 1 and this would be a 0 we have written. Now below I have drawn our induced voltage U being proportional to the negative rate of change in B. Let's write uh, U proportional to minus B prime. As you can see, a positive slope in B corresponds to a negative value in our voltage and vice versa. In the next line, I have drawn this same signal again, just amplified a bit. But how do we get back our information about the tape magnetization now? Well, let's assume we build a circuit that differentiates our measured voltage again. That's what I've drawn in the fourth line then we would end up with a signal proportional to the negative second derivative of B. That is the negative curvature. Let's call it minus B double prime. That sounds even more complicated, but let's take a look at the graph again. For a maximum in B up here, this would result in a positive value. For a minimum in B, this would result in a negative value. 
That's exactly what we need to distinguish between our two magnetization states. However, it only works if we always have a clear positive or negative curvature in our signal and if we avoid straight parts. That means that we should constantly change our magnetization level. That's the reason why in many tape formats ones and zeros are often coded as high-low and low-high transitions, respectively. And that way a long streak of zeros wouldn't cause this problem. As a last step we simply convert our analog voltage to a digital signal, like so, by comparing it to our reference voltage in the middle. In that way we can get back our 1 and our 0 we have stored on the magnetic tape. Let us take a look at the corresponding signal path inside the data set now. At the read head up here we start with our induced voltage U I've drawn here on the left side. And right after the read head, here, we see a standard differential amplifier producing an output proportional to this voltage. So this would be the 2 times u graph we've drawn up here. This is followed by a carefully designed differentiator producing our signal proportional to minus b double prime and finally we see a textbook inverting Schmidt trigger. The Schmidt trigger circuit converts our analog signal back to a digital TTL compatible signal by comparing it to a reference threshold and outputting either 0 volts or plus 5 volts. It also prevents ringing, that is, rapid unwanted changes in the output around the threshold due to noise. That's achieved by decreasing the threshold slightly after a positive crossing and by increasing the threshold by the same amount after a negative crossing. Let's see the circuit in action now. I am using LTSpice here as a simulation tool. So let's um, hit that run button and uh, take a look at uh, some results. Let's start with uh, the input signal uh, right at our read head. So that's the uh, induced, induced voltage really. And let's take a look at the signal right after our differential amplifier. So as you can see, this is only just an amplification and really nothing else. Let's take a look at the uh, differentiator now. That's, uh, that's uh, these two operational amplifiers over here. And let's take a look at the output right there. Okay, so this is in blue now. And as you can see, where uh, the green signal shows the maximum slope, we get the maximum value in our signal after the differentiator. And uh, we get a zero where our green signal has a horizontal slope and where our green signal has a negative slope we get a negative value in, uh, in our differentiator signal. So this all works pretty well. Now let's take a look at the, uh, the Schmidt trigger. As you can see it's an inverting Schmidt trigger. Um, wherever the red signal here is uh, above the threshold of the Schmidt trigger we, uh, we get a 0 volts and wherever the red signal is below the threshold we get our 5 volts. Um, let's take a look at, uh, at the changing threshold as well. Maybe we can just click here. Oops, sorry. There you can see it. So uh, now the green line shows the changing threshold value around 2 volts. Yeah, so that, uh, that all really works quite well. 
what I can show you here is the frequency response after our differentiator. And as you can see, up to a frequency of, oh, let's say, 5, 6 kilohertz, we have a linear ramp in, uh, in, the, in gain. And that's exactly uh, needed for a very clean differentiator circuit. Well, and that brings me to the end of this little rather technical journey into the inner workings of, uh, of the Commodore data set. I hope I could show you that, um, like any other good design, the data set really deserves respect for what it does. I am going to use it for my minimalistic breadboard CPU project, but that's for another YouTube video. I'll put a link in the description below. And of course you don't need to stop here. Playing around with a data set becomes even more fun when you try and implement higher speeds, a more refined data format or even experiment with error correction techniques. I'd love to hear about your ideas and suggestions in the comments. Take care. Bye and thanks for watching.